Previously, on Night of the Serpent. In a graveyard of giants, the heroes of Red Bazaar mount an assault on a knoll encampment, hoping to free its helpless tabaxi prisoner. The knoll encampment is constructed atop an embankment, and at its center is this massive leviathan skull, and it's from inside the skull that the party hears this tortured yowling. Sentries ring the place, watching the canyon for any signs of attack. Knowing that Vorne can't stealth, the party more or less just charges the encampment, without really much of a plan, much to my delight. During the fight, Heck's main limitation is that he can't see. It's nighttime, and he doesn't have dark vision. He can, however, see firelight emanating from inside the skull, so he flaps his way over the encounter and makes for the open eye sockets of the Leviathan skull. Peering into the eye socket, Heck can see a number of gnolls scattered below, but more importantly, he sees a tabaxi hanging by their rear paw, swinging over the ground. Scratching and fighting, the tabaxi is snapped at by a deranged-looking knoll on all fours, chittering incessantly. Something about this chittering almost seems to infect Heck, and he kind of begins to giggle himself, but manages to push this effect aside. Instead, he opens up on the knolls with his radiant beams, blasting several of them. Heck even attempts to blast the cord that's holding the tabaxi aloft, but he misses and hits the tabaxi instead. Then the laughter gets to him. Racked with insane laughter, Heck falls through the eye socket of the skull and lands prone. The deranged knoll, the fang of Yinagu, pounces and begins to tear the Arakakra apart. Meanwhile, outside, Thirteen is the only member of the party that even attempts a stealthy approach. But they are nonetheless dogged by sharp-eyed knollish sentries who pepper them with arrows. They slink between heaps of bone, they scramble along rib cages, and they eventually stab a knoll in the back with their short sword. But even with Vorn's help absorbing some of the damage, Thirteen is quickly overwhelmed and they go scrambling off looking for a place to hide, only to have the knoll's sharp nose sniff them out. Chased deeper into the encampment, Thirteen uses their claws to climb the side of the massive skull and to peer into the eye socket, where they notice Heck's plight. Heck lies unconscious, sprawled on the floor of the knoll's den, and is quickly being devoured by the ravenous fang of Yinagu. Thirteen leaps to the rescue. They cast cure wounds on Heck, and together the rogue and the monk quickly put down the fang of Yinagu. The pair of them rush back out to help Gulvife and Vorn with the rest of the knolls. For that is where the fighting is thickest, right at the mouth of the skull. At the beginning of the combat, Gulvife was immediately mobbed by a pack of hyenas. Since she can only attack one target per round, she has to slowly hack her way through the snarling beasts. Vorn is an unstoppable juggernaut, taking knoll after knoll attack, and one by one crushing each one beneath its fists. The pack lord is no pushover. She can rally her followers every round, and is a formidable opponent herself, but ultimately it's to no avail. She's finally slain when Thirteen comes up from behind and stabs her through the back. The battle's coda involves one pesky Nolish sniper, positioned atop a high and inaccessible pillar of rock. They've tossed pot shots down into the melee since the battle's very beginning. When next they take a shot, Heck catches the arrow, spins it around, and tosses it an impossible 120 feet up to strike the Null sniper and tumble them dead from the rock. Inside the skull, the characters rescue the Tabaxi, a hunter known as Lock Without Key. Thirteen perks up, in their dream, there is specific language about keys and locks, and locks without keys. Though not native to Chalt, born in faraway Mastica, lock, they learn, is a trailblazer, uh, a guide, taking treasure hunters and rich nobles on safaris throughout the jungles of Chalt. Ambushed at night, the tabaxi was a helpless prisoner of the Knolls for many days until the heroes of Red Bazaar came along to rescue them. As they depart, Thirteen notices blue-feathered arrows in Locke's quiver and flashes back to events from weeks ago. The session ends the following night, when, camping on a mountainside, the party awakens to discover that they cannot move. They watch in horror as Thirteen sits bolt upright and begins to march robotically out of the camp. And that's where we stopped. That's where we ended the session. How did it go? It went really well. Obviously, the session was dominated by this big set-piece encounter, but because we had ended the previous session right before that fight, everybody came in expecting this big fight. We were all ready for it. I did draw a map, but I wish I'd taken a better picture of it. I tried to include lots of different terrain effects. Elevation was a big factor. There were scattered bones that made stealth difficult. Uh, there were lots of things the party could climb on. There were so many different facets, so many different factors, it really felt like a big traditional 4th edition encounter, something we actually really haven't done in this campaign so far, and I loved it. Uh, so let's talk tactics. 
Vorn was going to be unstoppable, and I knew that. So I actually intentionally made the encounter much, much more difficult than a party of three fifth-level characters could possibly handle. I knew that Vorn would draw most of the aggro, I knew that it would absorb a lot of damage, and that it would protect 13, and that it would constantly heal itself. So there's like five or six gnolls every round constantly pouring all of their heat onto Vorn, but still enough encounter to go around to challenge everybody else. Um, the Pack Lord got a little bit hosed as a result. I wanted there to be sort of two big boss monsters in the encounter, the Pack Lord and the Fang of Yinagu. And the Fang of Yinagu really managed to shine in a way I was happy with, but the Pack Lord kind of got relegated to fighting an NPC, which ended up being a little bit boring. I need to, like, streamline my NPC versus NPC rules, because I feel like that just keeps happening session by session. But like I said, the Fang of Yinagu was my shining star. The name I stole, it's a classic Null monster name, but I changed it a lot. I sort of made it this kind of, like, ravenous, quadrupedal, sort of half-hyena, a half knoll creature, um, and I gave it basically a Tasha's Hideous Laughter aura, so anyone who starts their turn within this aura has to make a save, or else they fall into these fits of laughter. Um, and I'm not going to say it was deliberately a trap to catch Heck, but that's exactly what happened, and that made me very, very happy. This encounter was a great example of me actually challenging Heck and getting Heck on the ground and unconscious, and what's worse, failing death saves. So it was very, very rewarding to see the look on Jay's face. They normally just hover over the encounter and blast everybody to death, but the combination of the dark vision and the aura... And even though Heck is good at wisdom saves, they just managed to eventually fail one of them and fell right... And then, again, what's great about Tasha's Hideous Laughter is that it falls is that the target immediately falls prone. And if it's a flying creature, they stop flying because all they do is laughing. So Heck fell like 30, 40 feet, hit the ground, and then was mobbed by this knoll. 13 got to do what 13 does best, sort of scamper around and dip their toe into all three of the different theaters of the battle, you know, the archers and the sentries and the front lines a little bit at the end, and then the skull. For Gulvife, I feel a little bad because my initial idea was to just throw a pack of hyenas at them and let Gulvife take all the hits, but I think that H felt a little bit targeted by that, knowing that the Barbarian only gets one attack per round, at least right now. It made it this just slog fest of like, do I hit? Okay, it's dead. Next round, do I hit? Okay, it's dead. Do I hit? No, you missed. Oh, it's a wasted round because they're just mobbed by these hyenas. My intent was to sort of show that Gulvive can take a lot of damage. They're, they were minions. They had one hit point apiece. Again, another fourth edition element. But the notion was that if they all gang up, right, they constantly have pack tactics every round. And so as they're hitting and, and dealing all this damage to Gulvive, Gulvive raging, presumably, is, you know, blunting it and blunting it and blunting it. Look at how long Gulvive can stand there. But I think H ended up feeling kind of frustrated since they didn't really get into any of the wacky shenanigans of the fight. Yeah, but that was the fight. I felt like it was dynamic. There were a lot of different things going on. It was big and complicated, sure. And if I could improve one thing, I would. I want to streamline, as I said, my, my NPC versus NPC rules. Roll a d20 if it's success. They deal a set amount of damage. Don't worry about how much and like positions and stuff like that. Like Keep it really, really simple. Because I just find that keeps happening in this campaign. Then let's talk about Lock Without Key. It was really nice to introduce a new NPC, someone who's going to stick around with the party for a while. Um... They really, and they did really seem to take to lock, but they are suspicious. There was tons of in inside checks rolled, and they obviously noticed the blue feathers, which, if you remember from weeks and weeks and weeks ago, the party discovered a dead dinosaur outside their camp with a blue, feather blue feathered arrow in it, as though someone had left them a gift. So they are suspicious of Locke, obviously, but they haven't made enough inside checks to really figure out Locke's deal. I do have this bad tendency of introducing, like, mysterious NPCs that the party immediately wants to chip away at, and have their, they're always really dodgy with their answers, and it's getting to be a little bit boring. So probably next session I'll just have Locke spill the beans as to their specific history. Uh, Locke is the first non-binary NPC I've ever introduced. Um, it was interesting, but it actually proved weirdly difficult to remember. K is, uh, 13 is non-binary, and so I liked the idea that maybe that was a tabaxi cultural thing, that gender doesn't have as much uh, significance in their culture, and so I wanted to reinforce basically 13's choice by having the characters meet another tabaxi who's non-binary. And then there's that ending. What's happening? What's going on with the players? Right? What a cliffhanger. You'll have to wait and see what happens next time. And that was the session. It was a blast. It was a refreshing return to form for someone who really liked some of the big set-piece encounters in 4th edition. To port that over to 5th edition is always a really fun change of pace. How do you think the session went? Do you have any questions about Tomb of Annihilation, the way that I'm running the campaign? For your big combats, do you bust out the grid and the minis, or do you keep it all theater of the mind? Leave a comment below. I'm curious to see how you do it. We'll be back next week with another episode of Previously On, but until then, happy adventuring.